Welcome to this presentation in which we're going to discuss some um, practice materials that you are likely to find helpful, especially if you end up having a litigation practice. So let me first of all show you where you're going to find this material on Canvas. We go down here to Module 11, Practice Rules, and here is the PowerPoint that I will be spending some time with today, as well as uh, several other resources that we'll be looking at. So let's go to the PowerPoint. So what are practice rules? What do we mean when we say that? What we're referring to are the rules that relate to what the attorney and the paralegal does. So these aren't things that the client needs to do, but these are things that the attorney and paralegal uh, must do or must avoid doing in order to uh, appropriately represent the client. These primarily arise in the areas of litigation. In the area of litigation, we really have kind of four sets of rules. Well, I'll even say go far than that, I'd say six sets of rules. We have the rules for the Texas system and we have rules for the federal system. So now I'm going to say that there are three sets of rules for the Texas system and three sets of rules for the federal system. And um, in the Texas system, we have the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure, and we have the Texas Rules of Criminal Procedure. And the federal system, we have the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure and the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure. Then we also have appellate rules. So the Texas appellate rules of procedure and the federal appellate rules of procedure. Um, so those are the, the kind of the granularity. Uh, there's another layer of rules and that has to do with evidentiary rules. So I'm not going to, they fit into this practice rules paradigm, but we'll talk about those as we make a little bit of progress. So, for example, the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, just like the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure, explain how a case begins in the court system and how it ends and what the role is and the assigned tasks of everyone in that system. Um, so we'll be spending some time looking at those, but you'll learn more about those if, if you haven't already taken um, LGLA 1345, uh, which is the civil litigation class. Let me advance to our next slide here. Okay, so the most extensive set of rules that, um, well, I wouldn't say that they're more extensive than the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure, but they're an equally important one. Um, if you are in federal court, obviously follow the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. If you're in state court, you follow the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure. If you're in a Texas federal court, you're going to follow the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. There is no applicability of the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure unless you're in a Texas state court. Um, I have a variety of links here. I'm just going to um, show you those documents so that we don't have to wait for them to download. So the first one is the Cornell Law website. Very, very helpful. Lots of people use this. What I have here are the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, and you can see they're numbered. And you can click on any one of these and find out some cool rule. I'm going to focus on rule uh, 23, the class action rule. Let's look at that for a second. This explains how you set up a class action in federal court. Um, you can see it's, it's pretty detailed. One thing that is missing from the uh, Cornell website is there's not going to be any case annotations. So you're not going to be able to see all of the references that various and sundry courts have put on this particular rule. And there are hundreds, thousands of those. Let's also look at the answer. Let's see what the answer looks like. Let's see here. Looks like it might be rule seven. Um, Maybe it's rule eight. All right, so should I go to that film? Or no, it's what makes me think it's not really interesting. I mean, it wouldn't be impossible, but we already have very great disadvantage. I'm going to recall the film. Okay. 
Okay, let's just look at this. This is a description of what the pleading is. A pleading that states a claim for relief must contain, and then it says the particular things that have to be contained in it. And then it says in responding to a pleading, a party must, and then explains what the, the answer must look like. It must state in short and plain terms its defenses to each claim alleged against it, and admit or deny the allegations asserted against it by the opposing party. That's why when you see a federal answer, there's a lot of admit and deny, sometimes written in full sentences, sometimes just that one word. As a result, an answer filed in federal court can actually be longer than the uh, complaint because um, many times there might be a one, a one sentence statement and there might be you know four facts in that statement and maybe the uh, defendant is going to admit two of those facts and deny two of those facts. So he has to break down those facts in more detail. So it's interesting, but oftentimes, or sometimes at least, the answer is longer than the underlying complaint. We'll compare that with the um, Federal Rule of Civil Procedure here. Let's go look at Rule 85. Oh, here we go, and that number here. Let me scroll across slowly here. That rule is um, the original answer. What goes in that? You can see this is like a table of contents. And so I'm going to scroll to where that rule is in our document. And we'll see that what a answer is, it has the same name, but what an answer is in Texas State Court is very different than what an answer is in federal court. So here's our rule, rule 85, original answer contents. The original answer may consist of a motion to change venue, pleas to the jurisdiction, and in abatement, or any other delatter, that word, <laughs> pleas or of special exceptions, of general denial, and this is where we see the vast majority of answers in the state of Texas and any defense by way of avoidance or estoppel, <clears throat> and it will present a cross, and it may present a cross section, which to that extent will place defendant in an attitude of plaintiff, matters in avoidance and estoppel, <coughs> excuse me, may be stated together or in separate special pleadings, each presenting a distinct defense and numbered so as to admit of separate issues to be formed on them. So it doesn't say in the Texas rules anything about needing to admit or deny allegations asserted against it by the opposing party. That's just not part of our Texas system. You won't find that in a Texas, uh, docu Texas answer. This is our rule book and you can see if you're in state court, there's no need to follow the rule book in federal court. You'll also find the federal rules right over here. And the way that you would find it is you would go to Title 28, which is the judiciary uh, section. And you can see that they have the administration of courts and they have procedures. So we would go to this section and you can see it has um, the evidentiary rules. It has the process rules. All of the rules that we saw over here are going to be findable over here. And here is the official version. Again, this is still U.S. code. This was U.S. code here, but this was U.S. code uh, that Cornell has kind of put together and organized. And Cornell is obviously a private university. So then we'll go over here to the uh, federal government's uh, U.S. code, and we can see the same information here. We're over here in Title 28. I've just made it more granular as we've gone down, and we can see um, that we have the evidentiary rules, we have the rules of court down here, 131, and we could actually uh, do more, the rules of procedure with respect to evidence, um, and so forth. So, um, then here are Texas Rules of Evidence. Let's just look at one for a second. I'm going to go to 801. So we'd find it here in the index. That's the definition of hearsay in the state of Texas. So I'm just going to flow through till we find 801.
So here we go. Um, definitions that apply to this section. This is the hearsay section. Statement. It means a person's oral or written verbal expression or nonverbal conduct that a person intends as a substitute for verbal expression. Declarant means the person who made the statement. Matter asserted means et cetera, et cetera. And hearsay means a statement that the declarant, again, see this word here? You're gonna to have to refer up here. Remember when we were looking at statutes, how you, it almost becomes this uh, kind of endless uh, stream. That does not, the declarant does not make, actually, so we start here with statement. What is a statement? Well, here we have the definition of statement. That the declarant, this word, we would replace with this word, does not make while testifying at the current trial or hearing, and a party offers an evidence to prove the truth of the matter asserted, and that's this one. So. Again, this is a relatively short statement, but when you consider you also need to insert this, it becomes a rather complex statement. So this is the definition, Rule 801 in the state of Texas. This is the official rules from the state of Texas. There aren't gonna be um, case annotations, but there will be some comments that the rule makers have, have made about why they've made changes over time. Let me go back to our PowerPoint now. So we've kind of looked at the, the Texas, Federal Rules of Civil Procedure and the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure. Now, as you can see, there's actually more than I've, I've uh, presented. We've looked at the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, but they also have the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure. We looked at the Federal Rules of Evidence. We also have local rules. Let me just spend a second and pull that up. So to find local rules, you can find it in lots of places, but the, the one that's probably the easiest is just to look under Eastern, or whatever the, the court is, District of Texas, local rules. And so I'm going to pull this up. Eastern District of Texas, of course, is where we are. And you can see local rules, you'd have them right here. So we looked briefly at the Rule 23. We don't have any local rules on Rule 23, um, but uh, let's see if we've got any that might be of interest. Let's look at how um, we file matters. Filing of answers and defenses. And this would be, how do you request an extension of an answer? This is a very common task because you, you have a relatively little time to file an answer. The, the plaintiff in many cases have had, you know, months, weeks, years even to file or to prepare its uh, uh, complaint. But the defendant just has 21 days in federal court. And you can imagine that if this lawsuit is completely new, the defendant, many times the defendant will want more time. Now you may say, well, why would the plaintiff agree to give the defendant more time? There's a couple reasons. One is professional courtesy. Um, despite what you might see on television, uh, I would say most attorneys um, believe in the idea of professional courtesy and they understand that the defendant hasn't had very much time to prepare. And so uh, in most cases, the, the plaintiff's attorney will say, sure, I'll give you an extension. So that's one reason, just being a good ethical attorney. Another reason is that um, both, especially plaintiff's law firms are usually relatively small in terms of the number of legal professionals. And so they know that if they were to, to hold the defendant's feet to the fire, the defendant's law firm is often much bigger, um, then the defendant would probably feel like it's okay for me to do the same to the plaintiff's law firm. But in a large law firm, if I can't get to the answer, I can assign it or give it to someone else to work on because there's lots of people. But in a plaintiff's law firm, it may be a much smaller operation. And so the plaintiff may be thinking, I may need a break at some future day. If I haven't cut the defendant's attorney some slack, he's not gonna cut me slack. But if I do cut him some slack on this, it's, I can remind him, hey, remember when I extended your, your answer deadline? So now I need some help on the extension to this. Will you agree? 
and the attorney is likely to say or very possibly going to say yes under those circumstances. The third time that the, the third reason the plaintiff's attorney is likely to agree is that he knows that the judge would likely approve this motion. And so if he doesn't agree, he's likely to get a black eye with a judge. The judge is like, why did you deny this? This is a very reasonable routine thing unless you have some special reason um, that's kind of you're being a jerk. And so you don't want to have that kind of rapport with the with the judge. So that's an example of how this particular issue kind of plays out in the real world. And this gives you the specifics of our rule. Let's just compare this rule with rule 12 in the federal rules. So I'm gonna advance to the next rule. I guess they're not gonna let me advance easily, so I'll, I'll just go here. And you can see this is defenses and objections, when and how presented. And it explains, look here, within 21 days after being served with the summons in the complaint. Um, and so this is, again, so you'll find that local rules typically track pretty closely, sorry, with um, that. So this rule, local rule 12, is going to be about federal civil procedure 12. As a result, that's why there's some gaps. For example, there's no rule eight here or rule nine here because there's nothing that this particular Eastern District of Texas wants to add to the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure with respect to eight and nine. Let me go back here. So you can see that there's actually more rules than what I was sharing with you. Um, obviously, each one of these sets of rules have some different elements to them. They also have some similarities. If you practice bankruptcy law, you're going to know all about these bankruptcy rules. If you don't, every time you happen to do something that touches bankruptcy law, you're going to want to refer to the rules, obviously. Um, you can find, again, the, the federal and civil procedure rules in the U.S. Code. I showed you already where to find those. Uh, just a little refresher. This is where that is. Here we, we got granular, we got to the procedural rules in Title 28. And these are two different places to get the same information. So when you are looking up the rules, you wanna make sure you have the current edition. These change and get updated pretty regularly. So one very reliable source, or two very reliable reliable source, three actually, are going to be Westlaw, Cornell Law, and the government. Um, private websites that you go to um, may not be up to speed with the latest and greatest. Now, obviously, you're going to pay for Westlaw, so if you don't have a subscription to Westlaw, go with Cornell or with um, the, the state website. Those would be reliable sources to get you the latest and greatest in terms of the rules. So uh, Texas has rules of civil procedure and criminal procedure. They also have their own rules of evidence. Um, I showed you um, rule 801, the uh, um, um, uh, uh, rule of hearsay. Let me go back and just, we'll just pull up a um, rule of evidence. Let's see here. We just type in here Federal Rules of Evidence. We don't want bankruptcy rules. So let's look at this. This looks like this might be a good resource. Federal Rules of Evidence. Okay, so here, we're, let's see if we can find the hearsay rule. And you can see it's arranged similarly to the Texas rules. So Rule 801 is the hearsay rule. Let's just see what that looks like. And you can see it tracks very closely with um, the uh, the rule that we saw in Texas. We don't here in this upper portion have a definition for matter asserted. 
Um, so there's some differences, but there's a fair amount of, of following. So the Texas rules of evidence track numerically with the federal rules of evidence. The Texas rules of civil procedure, however, do not track numerically with the federal rules of civil procedure. So I just wanted to let you know that you can't always count on the two being correlated with each other. Um, so I guess that's pretty much all that I wanted to cover before we dive into Westlaw for just a little bit. So um, let's go over here to Westlaw. So here we are at home base. I'm going to, since I want to look at the Texas rules, I'm going to go to state materials. I'm going to go to Texas. Then I'm going to go to the statute and court rules. And you can see that we have uh, the Texas code of, of um, actually let's look at, I'm sorry, trial court orders. Let's, let's look at this. Actually, no, that's not what I want. I want this. So I'm going to get more granular here. Oops, that's not what I wanted. Here, I guess. Ah, here it is. It says Vernon's Texas Rules Annotate. They're not listing as Texas Rules of Civil Procedure, but that's what it is. So it's obviously called Texas Rules of Civil Procedure here and it's Texas Rules of Evidence. The Vernon's comes into play because that's what we call st the Texas statutes. And we call them Vernon's because the original publisher of them was in person named Vernon. So we're going to look at Rule 85. And so I'm going to look, I'm going to make uh, part two more granular and I'm going to scroll down to I'm going to look at pleadings. Uh, I'm not sure if it's in general or not. Uh, must be pleadings of defendant. So I want 85 original answer contents. We already looked at this same rule. Let me just go back and show you actually where was this over here. So we, we saw this document here and you can see that there's no annotations between them, but here we have, I'm sorry, I went to the wrong thing. Here we have the original answer and it's exactly the same language and you can see right here of general denial. But now we can look at these lovely annotations. We have 244 and you can see they're organized for us. So we might have an issue about general denials. And we can go here and look at the particular items in this place. Let's say we want to read more about general denials. Um, let's just pick this case here. I'm kind of doing it at random. You can see one of the things in the annotations in Vernon's that many times they're relatively old. So this is 76, 75, 75, 74. Um, that's probably older than you would want ideally. Let me just see if I can see something more recent. No, I can't. So I'm going to stick with this, but you know, it's okay if the first case you find isn't the best in terms of, of the year because I can uh, get citing references for this case, or I can get key numbers. So maybe I am very interested in this number. Ah, this is what I'm interested in. Well, I can click on this and get much more recent cases. So the annotations in Vernon's won't include every single case. So I can probably find some cases that are a lot newer. And you can see 83 here, 2001. There's also some older ones. Or I could also cite this case 
or find out what other cases have cited it. Because if other cases have cited it, probably those are going to be, and they may cite them for another reason, but we have here a um, Supreme Court case from 1980. You'd want to see if it's on the same issue. Then we have one from here from 89. So we have some more recent leads. I'm going to just backtrack. I could also go to history and just find where I was. I'll just go back here. So I'm going to go to rule 85. Or I could just hit the back button until I get to the one that I wanted. And I'm going to look again at um, the, uh, the, the cases. So you can see there's just a lot of different topics that we can look at on this particular category. So that's what Westlaw gets you that we haven't seen anywhere else. We're going to get lots and lots of cases um, that will let us have more granularity about what these mean. Um, we can also do the same thing with the, let me go to, oops, sorry, here we go. Let me go to Let me just start from scratch and retrace our steps here. And now let's look, you can see the, uh, the Texas rules of um, criminal procedure would be here. And now we can find the Texas federal court rules. So again, we could look for all the different courts, but we were looking at the Eastern District before. So let's go here and look at the Eastern District here. Let's refresh and see what we actually looked at. We looked at Rule 12. So let's pull up Rule 12 in this context. Rule 12 right here. Again, it's the same rule. An attorney may request that the deadline be extended for a defendant. An attorney may request that the deadline be extended for a defendant. Let's see if there's any cases. Nope, there's no cases on this one. Let's um, go to the next one, see if we can find one with annotations. No annotations here. Local rules oftentimes don't have cases about them, so I'm not tremendously surprised we're not seeing them. But if there were some, we'd be able to see it here. And again, not looking like we're going to hit pay dirt. We'll do one more. But if, there, if, the, if they were available, they would be here. They would not have appeared in uh, the, the government documents or in the Cornell documents. What you're getting when you, ah, oh, here we go, citing references. That must be where they're, they're listing them. So, it, so there's no cases here, but they do have some secondary sources that we could look at. Unfortunately, they're out of our plan, but, but there are some tools that we can use if we want to dive a little bit deeper. Um, let me go back to home base. So the takeaway is that West obviously costs money, but you can get cases and additional information um, that will help you find those particular resources and those particular uh, sources of information. So um, at this point, I think we're done with the presentation. Um, just know that flipping through the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure or the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, depending on when you practice, is something that attorneys and paralegals do multiple times of the day, often, but at least a, 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 sometimes a week. This is probably the most dog-eared book that you deal with. And most um, paralegals and attorneys will have the current set of those rules in on their desk. Um, there's publishers like O'Connor's and others that will publish desk sets. And every year you get a new desk set of those particular books. So um, it is a very important resource to be able to find and to have the current information and to be able to make sense of those rules. So. Hopefully this has helped make more sense of what I talk about when I talk about things like the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. At this point, I think we're done with this presentation. I thank you for your attention and I hope you have a wonderful day. 
if you have questions, please don't hesitate to uh, uh, email me what you what is on your mind. Thanks so much.